Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. While the calendar shows that we're getting ready to finish out the world's hottest summer ever, the fact is that's not going to be the end of the heat. Whether it's the weeks of 110 plus degree temperatures in Arizona and Texas, the Isle of Maui in Hawaii that right now is burning out of control, the drying out of the Colorado River, the tornadoes in many southern states, the flooding that has destroyed towns in Vermont, the historic 2021 flooding of the Major Deegan Expressway from Hurricane Ida right here in the Bronx, or the simple evidence that this year New York City showed its least snowy winter season. There can be no doubt that the earth is getting hotter and obstructionists who deny that climate change is the direct result of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions are actually destructionists of the planet that is home to all of us. So tonight on Bronx Talk, we'll provide some unique visuals from an artist who uses his work to help illustrate what is contributing to the heating of our world and also review legislation and other advocacies that can give us a chance to reverse the trend. Please join me in welcoming back to Bronx Talk here in our studio, environmental and social justice artist, Daniel Lanzalotta. Nice Thank to you, see Carrie. you, Daniel. And uh, on Skype, all the way from the capital, from New, uh, Albany, New York, uh, the uh, policy advocate for the organization Earth Justice. It is Liz Moran. Ms. Moran, nice to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Daniel, let's uh, start with you. Um, you um, we've told this story before, but let's introduce you to viewers. Why and how did you get started? And it's right on your lapel, collecting plastic and turning it into jewelry. Mm -hmm. Uh, it started out very innocently. I was living in the southwest of France, in Biarritz, France, on the border of uh, Spain and France. And I would take my son, at the time was three years old, and I would sit by the Atlantic Ocean there in Biarritz, and I would assemble pieces of plastic. It was all very innocent. And, he and, and you hadn't thought at the time that, oh, the this is, you know, and here's an example of some of the jewelry that he makes and sculptures and things. But... And, and so you didn't say, wow, this is, you know, what's heating up our I, world? I didn't realize the magnitude of how much. And then little by little, I started to notice uh, repetitious pieces of plastic. And I was questioning all of that. And then I would go collecting them. I would go down. I would drive up by Bordeaux all the way down to St. Sebastian, Spain. And I would see the same plastic over and over and over again. And I started to wonder what was going on there. And then some time went by and... Slowly but surely, I became an environmentalist using plastic debris to speak to the issues of ocean health and in other environments. Um, and over a course of 28 years, 29 years, I've been doing this now. Time flies and I've seen a complete change and there is certainly a connection between plastic use and the uh, global warming or how, mm -hmm. how plastics impact the environment that way. And um, you say there was a change, a change for the worse in, Absolutely. in, the, in the climate. Absolutely. <clears throat> so what I introduced the show with, you are on board with. Yes. <clears throat> um, so he, he, we, we got to show this. He, we were, he was on the Bronx Buzz, my, our other program. But uh, can I hold this uh, up? Yes, absolutely. So, so th these are, I'm going to just hold these up. These are, I don't know how well we could see it. But these are tiny little plastic, what are these? Those mm -hmm. are crack vials. Crack cocaine. These are crack vials that you picked out of where? Parks? I picked them up off the streets of uh, the Bronx, South Bronx, Brooklyn, um, Harlem. And uh, it started out innocently as a single stream use of plastic. Look at the size <clears> of <throat> the bag. Ironically, in a plastic bag, we were joking <laughs> yeah. about that. It's a very... Um, there's a, there's a lot to this project. It's now into its fourth year, and I just recently started the, the sculpture using these. Um, you, you were talking to me uh, when we showed these on our other program on the Bronx Buzz. You were talking to me that it's kind of a double poison, so to yes, speak, because yes. the plastics and... and well, why it's, don't it's, you, it's, you explain it's, it? Go ahead. It's a little more than that. It's, it's the single stream use of plastic in the environment, and there's residual crack cocaine in there. And since we don't know really what the co 
the crack is cut with, it's usually cut with fentanyl and that's extremely toxic. So when I'm collecting these things, I'm wearing gloves and I have solutions. So now to, I, I better go no, wash not my now. hands. These have all been disinfected, okay. but um, it's, it, is, it is very uh, tricky to pick them up. Uh, I've seen some very horrible things over the last four years collecting them. Uh, there is a, a, an epidemic of crack cocaine in black and brown communities, and that's how my the story has morphed into more of a social statement about it. And so it's not only the fact that the plastic in the park has got a chance to just be there for you know the next who knows how many thousands. Well, of it's years. the residual runoff that's in the container of the crack file that is detrimental to the water table and right. where these are going. Um, we're going to show a bit on the table. You can see we have some of the jewelry. We're going to show that in a minute. I don't want to leave uh, Liz Moran hanging. Ms. Moran, nice to have you with us um, this evening. Uh, let's just uh, start uh, with you on Earth Justice. Wh who is Earth Justice? What is Earth Justice? And what is it that uh, you folks do uh, to um, uh, address climate change? Yeah, so Earth Justice is the first and largest nationwide environmental legal nonprofit. So we work to uh, fight the climate crisis and protect public health, the environment and wildlife, have a safe and healthful environment uh, nationwide in the courtroom, in Congress and in state houses. So I am honored to work for Earth Justice here in Albany, New York and make sure New York State is a nation leader on these issues. How, how, you know, on one hand, I'm so tempted to ask you about the rest of the country, but I, but I won't. But for want of a better term, uh, the political climate has shifted. And I called out uh, people who are obstructionists. I just, it's, it's just not science to think that climate change is not a problem. How difficult is that effort in New York State, which now has, you know, uh, three Democratic-controlled uh, um, legislatures? You know, thankfully, New York State has a nation-leading climate law in the books. It's known as the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, and it follows the science. It ensures that New York State has, in law, mandates to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, along with some intermediary goals. And we are making some progress. But of course, there is a lot more work to do. Even in a state like New York, we are still dealing with well-endowed corporate fossil fuel interests that are trying to slow down action on climate change. Um, but we're making progress. Well, that, that's encouraging. And of course, you know, you, it would be nice if we could create like a little silo around the state of New York and say, well, this is what we've done. Um, but of course, the, there are factors worldwide, obviously, that, that affect this. Um, let's just um, address some of the, the needs now and the things that, because I know that you and Earth Justice have some advocacies. You were telling me earlier about the New York Heat Act. I'd like to understand what that is. Is that something you expect that we're going to hear talk about once they, um, the legislators get back to Albany on January 1st? Yes, I think this is going to be a huge priority for a number of communities across the state. Um, you, started, you started the show off with this, right? We have had a hot, expensive climate crisis summer here in New York. These are not impacts that are far off. We saw uh, very dangerous air quality from the wildfires in Canada for a number of days this summer, uh, extreme heat, uh, uh, unprecedented levels of flooding in a number of regions in the state. And, you know, there's this meme online about how hot summers have been, right? This is the hottest summer we're experiencing yet. <laughs> so we really need to make sure we're addressing so the what, what would, what would the So what would the HEAT Act do to address this? I mean, I'm, I'm certainly in agreement, and I think you'd, you'd have to be in agreement that it is the hottest summer ever. But what, what are we looking for legislators to do? Well, not only are we reeling from the impact of the climate crisis, but because of how expensive gas is, people are dealing with ever-increasing utility bills. So the NY Heat Act is a key way to address both the climate crisis and the increasing costs of our utility bills. It would cap utility bills 
at 6% of a household's income, that's going to save households about $75 a month every year. Uh, so that is a significant chunk uh, of savings. That would be significant, yes. But I, I can't imagine utility companies, and you can start with Con Ed, would, would say, oh, okay, let's just do that. Um, so what, what's what's the trade-off and, and what are we looking for them to do kind of in return? Yeah, so a, the reason why this would help in terms of saving New Yorkers' money is not just for that 6% cap. We also would be ending subsidies to expand gas infrastructure. It really doesn't make sense for us at this point to keep building out gas, gas infrastructure when we know we need to move away from it. Right now, it's free to get hooked up to a new gas line, uh, but it's not free because everyday customers are actually paying for that. We're subsidizing it through our rates. So what this legislation would do is it would end that subsidy and give utilities like Con Ed the legal tools they need to pursue options that are not gas, like heat pumps, for example. Right, and give them incentive to uh, modernize their um, uh, transmission and their creation of energy uh, to ways that w would not uh, hurt or hurt the environment, right? That's what that's basically what we're talking about. Um, how it, it seems logical to me. Um, how difficult is, do you expect this to be in the legislature, in the uh, Senate and uh, Assembly? I mean, is this going to be a, much like we're still fighting for the New York Health Act? Um, and, uh, you know, many people agree this is what we ought to do, but there's factors that are preventing it. Yeah. Well, there should be an urgency to act with the NYT Act, in part as a response to what we just saw this summer. You know, New Yorkers are looking to Governor Hopeful to help them save money on their bills and to protect their communities. The NYT Act should be the solution the governor chooses as she approaches this Mm -hmm. We made progress this past year on this bill. The Senate had included it uh, in their version of the budget, and they actually passed it as a standalone bill as well. Um, you know, addressing buildings is a really important area for the state. Buildings actually make up the majority of our greenhouse gas emissions, our climate pollution in the state. Uh, so the state passed a mandate for all electric new construction, which is excellent. NY Heat Act makes sense to keep this progress going and save New Yorkers money at the same time. Uh, Ms. Moran, we'll get back to you in a moment. I want to talk with you in a moment about transportation, but I, I want to do something here in the studio. And there's, I, you know, I didn't do a lot of research on this. So this was a bag of mandarin oranges that I bought and, and they, were, they were delicious and healthful, but the mesh is a plastic mesh and the uh, label is obviously all plastic. And you know, when you finish it, I'm like, well, what should I do with this? And the only option that I can think of is throwing it in the garbage because it's not recyclable. I'm gonna give you two other examples. I, uh, whoops, almost dropped it. Uh, I had mustard <laughs> for a hot dog. And um, you, this is such tough, some kind of mylar or something that you can't even break into it. And again, after you have the mustard, it goes into the waste stream. And then the last one, our friend Daniel Lanzalotta brought this cup um, with water in it. Now we gave him a mug to pour it in. But this is not a paper cup. And um, uh, Daniel, coated. you, you um, said you had uh, seen some video uh, under the ocean that is yeah. covered with these. Yeah. Oh, uh, You told me years ago, probably sitting in the same seat, that what we need to do is figure out how to deal with packaging. That, and these are, I mean, mustard, uh, you know, mandarin oranges and coffee. Who doesn't have a cup of coffee? What, what do we do? I mean, th th <laughs> this is su literally suffocating that's, the planet. That's the $64 million question. I mean. It's larger legislation than, than they can handle in Albany. This would have to be it's called human. It's called human uh, behavior modification. And it takes a long, long time to get people to change their, their ways of, of, of behaving and utilizing stuff and purchasing and shopping. And, and look at, uh, there's a big, a big store that has a lot of uh, inexpensive or discounted 
uh, prices on on their foods. They're all over the all over the place. I won't mention them by name, but look at the size of shopping carts. They're they're and, they're, and they're, they're, they're gigantic. They're filled with they're, they're filled they're with gigantic. items that are all you right. Know, um, so. I, I want I do want to talk about uh, composting um, because I, you know we try to find things that, that everyday Bronxites can do, um, and now um, New York City uh, is. Um, Going to, uh, they passed the city council passed a bill requiring uh, New Yorkers to separate their food waste uh, from regular trash uh, with mandatory composting coming to all five boroughs next year. I know in my building, instead of two day collections, uh, now we have I think I, I think it's like five day collections. So we have a list. I just wanted for to get this is how we can all participate. Rather than I was in a, a different state with family, and I was like. What do I do after I have breakfast? And, I, and they were like, well, just throw it in the garbage. But here, fruit and vegetable scraps, non-greasy food. You can see coffee grounds and filters, tea bags, egg and nut shells, pits, dry to cut flowers, house plants, and potting soil. No bugs, of course. Make sure that's the case. And um, those are things everyday Bronxites can do. You see the brown bins in your building or down your block or outside. Uh, please, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you to compost. Uh, there was, I thought, kind of a cool website that I'm going to put up also that is the Definitive Guide to Composting. It is, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the um, website right there. Um, let's get back to um, Ms. Um, Moran. Let's just talk about transportation. We're just trying to cover, we're trying to cover, a, you know, a 15-hour um, a dialogue in a half hour here. Um, Ms. Moran, let's just talk about the transportation sector. Um, you, you know, how, how important and how possible is it to electrify uh, our uh, transit systems right now? Yeah, I mean, this is a sector that is ready for electrification, much like buildings. The technology is totally there. Uh, we really just need more political will in many cases, including with dealing with plastics. Um, and composting, we need more political will to start mandating the transition, adding more funding resources to get more vehicles all electric. Uh, New York State's making some progress here as well. We do have a mandate to start electrifying our state vehicle fleet, but we really need to address more areas here, like public transportation. We should have all electric buses on the roads. Do um and so that is is there legislation for that now or that's something that you and uh, folks at Earth Justice will be working on through uh, the next calendar year? There is legislation to address this. It's known as the Green Transit Green Jobs Bill. It's carried by by Assemblyman Dinowitz, who is been on your show. Um, yes, and is a, a representative of part of the Bronx. Um, and uh, Senator Kennedy, who's out in Buffalo, another big transportation, public transportation city in uh, the state. And this legislation would phase out the purchases of fossil fuel vehicles by 2029. This is perfectly reasonable. It makes total sense to start getting more electric buses on our roads. They will be cleaner for our communities. It'll create good jobs. And it'll help us in our efforts to address a pretty large sector of climate pollution. You know, I like, um, you know, the legislation, both of these um, bills that you are talking about. There's also the, you mentioned Assemblymember Dinowitz, he sponsored the Climate Change Superfund Act to have polluters pay for the cleanups. And that's basically, Ms. Moran, what you suggested earlier with um, utility companies. You want to urge them that it'll be easier for you if you handle things in a different way and, and it'll be more profitable for you. I, I think those are the kinds of um, legislation that just makes sense because it's not just saying, well, now we want to create a policy, but it's giving um, you know, companies a financial uh, incentive to, to do better, to you know, at least address the climate in, in what they do. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it should not be everyday New Yorkers who didn't have a choice in the matter for paying for the climate crisis. It right. needs to be corporate polluters. It needs to be the fossil fuel industry that's paying up. They spent billions of dollars over the course of decades lying about the reality of climate change, about their role in causing the climate crisis, and led to decades of delay. So we're in the crisis because of what they did. So 
the climate super fund is important because it takes the principle of you made the mess, you should be the one to clean it up. Clean it up, yeah. And, exactly. So it, it's this certain, is a great bill. It certainly makes sense. I want to um, show off some jewelry though uh, before we run out of time. Uh, we have stuff on the, on the desk here. Uh, do you want to show us, um, um, Daniel, what each one of these is? I mean, how well, do, we have do you uh, pieces. All, all the pieces on the <clears throat> table here on the desk are okay. made from uh, trash from the streets of Manhattan. Um, and I make, I punch out each bead. Each bead is handmade, uh, except for this piece. This piece is uh, debris from France. Wow, and uh, that's plastic debris from the ocean. And and there's an and you know it's funny for people who make jewelry and other um, fun things. Um, there's sometimes you need materials. There's there's no shortage. There's here. no shortage. Uh, it's it's not going away anytime soon, and it's constantly coming at me. Uh, just coming over to the studio, I was picking stuff. Really, off, right right outside. So I got some nice new colors. The, the, uh, so the, it's ne it's never ending. This is quite lovely. Uh, or, oh, I mean, it's funny. Uh, you know, you want some materials? No, I no, I'm good. You, I'm good. I'm you, good. <laughs> either that, or it. it um, we can uh, uh, send you to the supermarket and no, you pick it up uh, on your own. But some of these, like, like, look at these earrings. I'm, I'm going to pick it up. Our director is not going to like me. There we go. Well, we can show it to you. These are really there. It is. Look at that. Oh, Gary. Okay. It, it doesn't look too bad. Um, anyway, Ms. Moran, let's uh, start uh, wrapping it up here. Um, but what can everyday Bronxites do? What, what, I mean, aside, I know, realize you work in the political end, um, but what can everyday Bronxites do um, to participate? To me, my reason for mentioning composting and some of these other things um, is to <clears throat> just get people engaged to realize that it's important for all of us and, and you know, um, using paper instead of plastic or you know, making sure to recycle what can be recycled um, is a way that we can do whatever we can. That's the way I feel about it. Certainly paper now should be recycled at all times, et cetera. But, but what are your thoughts, uh, Ms. Moran, and, and Earth Justice? What do, you, what do you guys think? Yeah, so of course it's important to be able to do what you can in your own home to reduce your climate footprint. Um, but what I think is so important for every New Yorker to do is be in touch with your state elected officials. Uh -huh. You should reach out to them and tell them how much it's important for you that they act on climate in this state budget, in this legislative session. Your local elected officials should know who you are, know you care. That has a huge impact. And they care about your voice because your constituents. Mm -hmm. Certainly um, seems to make sense. You know, um, Al Gore did uh, the... Uh, inconvenient Truth 20 years ago, and um, I, I, nobody listened, or I don't want to say nobody listened, but they, worldwide, I mean, he basically predicted what we're seeing outside our windows right now. To me, that's just really sad. It's not like we, gee, we didn't know. <laughs> we knew. And he said there would be tornadoes and floods and and you know ferocious weather and all that, and that's exactly what we're getting. Um, well, I, I, are you hopeful? Um, Ms. Moran, it's it's hard to be hopeful, I suppose, because the trend seems to be going in the wrong direction. Do you do you, do you, are you are you and the folks at Earth Justice hopeful? Like with some of this legislation you're working on, certainly statewide, but if it can spread, um, that things could be better in 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 terms of climate. You know, we are hopeful. You're right. Things have gotten very dire with the climate crisis, and this is having very real impacts on people right now will struggle to breathe during those bad air quality days from the Canadian wildfires. People couldn't travel because of the flooding from the extreme and sudden rainfall. These are very real impacts that government has to address. But New York State has big impacts. We're the 10th largest economy globally. The things we do here does have a ripple effect. It is so important for New York to continue being and to really step up as a national and global leader on these issues. You, you know, one thing I wanted to mention, um, to her credit, the governor came up, I think it was $5 billion for um, energy infrastructure. I know there was some considerable frustration, especially in the South Bronx, about peaker plants not being closed. Um, do you, um, you must see that as a sign of hope that uh, they're going to try and convert a, a big Queens transmission plant to uh, wind energy. I mean, that, that, that would give us uh, hope that, that 
at least we can do our part. Oh, yes. The $5 billion bond act is phenomenal. Uh, of course, in many ways, it's a drop in the bucket. We need a lot more. Um, you know, the State Department of Environmental Conservation has been following the climate law and denying air permits for a lot of dirty, polluting facilities. Uh, that has to continue. So Got it. Head in the right direction, but got to do more. Good. Folks, check out uh, Earth Justice on the web. And uh, Liz Moran, we thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, Daniel, I'm, you know, I love the work that you do. Thank you so much. And it is incredibly creative and smart. Um, I'm wondering um, if your dream comes true and there's no plastic out there. I don't know. Uh, to I don't, you to so, I don't, I don't see that anytime soon. I would no, just I'm like so to see uh, people make better choices about what they're doing and how they're contributing mm -hmm. uh, to the overall health of the planet. Um, for you in, in making choices, what, what, aside from doing what you do, um, what do you do privately to make a choice that you think would, is helpful and, and maybe instructive for other people? Try not to use uh, or purchase things of this nature. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, buy, you can buy, buy you can buy bag. yes, you can buy paper bags. Oh stuff. boy, you I've can, been admonished. Loose fruits and vegetables. Don't uh, buy vegetables of oranges for instance they're use they're peeling the orange and wrapping them in some kind of plastic wrap. Oh, i've seen that i yeah, mean yeah. Uh, it doesn't take all that much effort to uh, do your own orange you just got to be conscious of it it's it's behavior modification and, and on a global scale though well uh, listen you got to start with, I, I can only talk to the people of the bronx my brothers and sisters you have to uh, start you somewhere too. thank right. you so much and thank, thank liz you. moran and thank, thank you, you daniel thank you, liz. Lanzalotta. We thank our producer, uh, Rebecca Hemick, uh, director Nick Marrero, the cast of thousands who work with us here in the studio. <laughs> and uh, next week, very important show. We can talk about some of these issues as well. Congressman Richie Torres will be here. His district is the only one that um, serves only the Bronx. I mean, all the other congressional districts have a little piece of the other boroughs. So if um, the curtain don't fall and the creek don't rise, we'll be here next week. See you then.